Hey everyone, Laszlo Montgomery here with another China History Podcast episode. This time in the first of two parts, we look at the extraordinary life of the man who loved China, Dr. Joseph Needham. The Man Who Loved China, of course, the book from 2008 by author Simon Winchester. In the UK, the book came out as Bomb, Book, and Compass, Joseph Needham and the Great Secrets of China. Simon Winchester is, of course, known for many past titles, The Surgeon of Crowthorn, A Tale of Murder, Madness, and the Oxford English Dictionary, The Map That Changed the World, William Smith and the Birth of Modern Geology, Krakatoa, The Day the World Exploded, August 27th, 1883, and most recently, The Men Who United the States, America's Explorers, Inventors, Eccentrics, and Mavericks, and the Creation of One Nation, Indivisible. Simon Winchester. Joseph Needham, if you recall, was mentioned in CHP episode number three, covering the four great inventions. My main source for that early episode was Robert Temple's fine book, of which Needham wrote the intro, called The Genius of China. This book was a finely distilled greatest hits package of Needham's magnum opus and labor of love, Science and Civilization in China, This work was already 17 volumes long when Needham passed from this earth in 1995. And since he left us, seven more volumes have been published. It's a massive work and remains a work in progress. I'm using for this episode Simon Winchester's book. I lived in Hong Kong around the same time he was living there as a journalist. He was... One of the many writers I particularly remember, and I loved reading his stuff. Just as Robert Temple distilled Needham Science and Civilization in China down to a nice bento box size, so do I hope to bring you the essence of Mr. Winchester's The Man Who Loved China. Joseph Needham indeed loved China. He had a pretty interesting story, and he was quite a character in his own right. When you have an extraordinarily high IQ and by the age of 25 produce all kinds of academic achievements, recognized and admired by scholars much older than you, you're already given a very wide berth as far as how far you're allowed to go on the outrageous scale. Needham was one such person. He was a certifiable weirdo in some ways. In our day, he'd be perfectly normal, especially here in Cali. But... Joseph Needham wasn't born in sunny L.A. He was born in London in the year 1900. And the kind of things you can get away with today were not the kind of things you can get away with back then. On the cover, Simon Winchester calls his book The Fantastic Story of the Eccentric Scientist Who Unlocked the Mysteries of the Middle Kingdom. Eccentric is maybe too soft a word, but he certainly can be slotted in that category. Noel Joseph Terence Montgomery Needham, no relation, was born in London, an only child. His father was a doctor, and his mother was musically gifted and composed for a living. She was a free spirit and, by all accounts, appeared born at the wrong time, about a century too early. The Needhams were not working-class people. What is there to say about the boy Joseph Needham except that he was noticeably brilliant at an early age, and was given all the tools and stimuli to nurture his oversized mind. He went to the best schools from his earliest age and went straight to Cambridge in 1918. And for the rest of his life, he was associated with that historic and magnificent institution. And to this day, though Needham left us two decades ago, the association between Cambridge and Needham is alive and well through the Needham Research Institute and the venerable Cambridge University Press, and in many other ways that are not as well known. His rooms at Keyes College were later taken over by another famous Cambridge alum by the name of Stephen Hawking. His mother maybe passed on the predisposition to strange and off-kilter behavior, but it was his father who instilled in him that iron will discipline to learn and think like a scholar. He grew up surrounded by his father's books and accompanied his father to various places on the continent, each one a field trip involving the ongoing accumulation of learning and experience. 
A rotating cast of characters came and went in Joseph Needham's early life. Some were mentors who provided a great deal of inspiration at the right time as far as leading him to a life of science. Maybe it was his mother, maybe it was just the liberals he knew, but from an early age all the way to the very end, Needham was a dyed-in-the-wool socialist, and I dare say perhaps a communist as well. He never joined either party, but to say his politics were pretty left-leaning is an accurate statement. And Needham believed science was one way in which he could help the greatest number of people. Needham didn't last long at Cambridge as a pre-med. Becoming a doctor, just like his pa, wasn't the life for him. In that same year he started at Cambridge, the 1918 flu pandemic hit hard. He was one of the half billion people in the world who got infected, but was not among the 3-5% to 5 of the world's population who perished in the pandemic. Needham gravitated to the field of biochemistry, the branch of science concerned with the chemical and physiochemical processes that occur within living organisms. He was fortunate in that he studied under one of the greats of his day in this up-and-coming field of science, Frederick Goland Hopkins. Hopkins would go on to win a Nobel Prize in 1929 for his co-discovery of vitamins. He served as Needham's professor, and his Hopkins lab became an incubator for many new discoveries and innovations, not to mention a few great scientists as well, Needham being one of them. Simon Winchester, who I'll quote regularly in this episode, said Needham was remembered as, quote, the clever, tall, rumpled, amusingly eccentric doctoral student from a smart college and with a reasonably exotic family background, a man known for being a chain smoker, a singer, and no mean dancer, end quote. He was totally into this thing called Morris dancing, which dated back to the 15th century. It's this kind of corny folk dancing with bells on your knees and you carry some stick or pole and everyone goes through these stylized steps and clap their poles together. I watched some on YouTube and I couldn't turn away. Kept wondering who still does this and how did it last this long? Well, Needham was into it and was a lifelong enthusiast. Indeed, Needham was also quite a chain smoker and like another famous chain smoker named Deng Xiaoping, he lived well into his 90s. But Needham never lit up before noon, as a general rule. On the one hand, he was this rather bodacious and flamboyant character and a devout nudist. And he was very religious, too, and attended church regularly. But on the other hand, he had this obviously brilliant mind, already spoke seven languages fluently, and was able to read and observe vast amounts of information and process it quickly. He met his wife, Dorothy, at this uh, laboratory run by Hopkins, and she went on to become a brilliant biochemist in her own right, specializing in the biochemistry of the muscles. They married on September 13th, 1924, and would remain together until the very end, Dorothy passing first. It was, as Simon Winchester described, quote, an open and modern marriage. Needham, in his early 20s, had already set the academic world on fire, and he was plying his wares in one of the most competitive and renowned institutions in the world. What else was there to do except begin writing books? His first foray into this craft was a collection of essays about great scholars of days gone by, and this was followed by something with a little more heft, three volumes on chemical embryology, a work that his peers took notice of. All the way up to 1937, Needham had established himself at Cambridge and in worldwide academia as a brilliant scientist. But the curtain was coming down on this first chapter in Joseph Needham's life. A new world opened up to Joseph Needham when he met Lu Guizhen. Lu Guizhen was his muse. I guess you could say she was the one who facilitated the transformation of this wild and brilliant biochemist and polymath into the man who loved China. She left China just before the Japanese invasion began in July 1937. She was a 33-year-old biochemist on her way to the renowned Hopkins lab at Cambridge, where she would work with both Joseph and Dorothy Needham. Like Dorothy, Guizhen specialized in the same field of biochemistry involving the muscles. Dorothy took Guizhen under her wing. 
Shortly thereafter, Joseph Needham fell in love with Lu Guizhen. The connection and the love he had for her was overpowering. And from there on out, although this may sound strange, the three of them sort of became a trio. Dorothy put up with the affair for her own reasons, and that was that. And from that time in 1937 until the end came in the 1990s, these three lives were all intertwined. In fact, their colleagues and friends referred to all three as the Needhams. Like Dorothy Needham, Lu Guizhen was quite the extraordinary woman. They were both in love with Needham, and he stuck with them until the day both of them passed. And all three lived to a very ripe old age. I suppose if Simon Winchester entitled his book, The Man Who Loved Women, the same could hold true for Needham. Obviously, he had this rather unconventional relationship with Dorothy and with Gui Chen. But that aside, he really had an eye for beautiful women. And let's just say there was nothing Victorian or reserved about him when it came to one-night stands and other kinds of romantic liaisons. If Lu Guizhen never walked into his life, I suppose Joseph Needham might have gone on to all kinds of groundbreaking discoveries in biochem, maybe a Nobel Prize or two. By the time she came to town in 1937, as far as in academic circles, Joseph Needham was quite the well-known brand name. As I said, he was already acknowledged by his peers, some of the most accomplished minds walking around England in those days, as a brilliant scientist. Like many brilliant minds, he saw things that most mere mortals didn't see. Needham was able to see something, take it in, and draw parallels to other bits of data back then when your head was your thumb drive. And he could see connections and relationships with other seemingly unrelated matters and bits of data. He had the gift of a massive online relational database conveniently located inside his cranium. That was Joseph Needham's greatest gift. His other great gift was that he could zoom way out to get the bigger picture and was able to write about it in the minutest and most accurate detail. But after meeting Lu Guizhen and falling in love with her, almost immediately Needham found in her a muse who opened his eyes to China. Her beauty Brains and brilliance as a scientist attracted Needham, but it was what happened after Needham's attraction that ended up having such a profound impact on so many people. Unless they were separated by some academic conference or sojourn somewhere, Joseph and Dorothy Needham lived together in the same house. Lu Guizhen lived down the street. And Dorothy put up with the affair, and you couldn't tell there was anything unusual or tense going on. If it bothered Dorothy... Certainly never showed. The end of 1937 through the beginning of 1938 saw the affair between Needham and Guizhen heat up, as affairs tend to do at the outset, I guess. And the immediate outcome from this affair was that Needham's eyes were opened up about China. Guizhen had done such a swell job of igniting that passion. In fact, you could say the life of Joseph Needham, the brilliant biochemist, ended here. And Joseph Needham, the man who loved China, began... And that was what 1938 and 39 were all about. Needham threw a great deal of energy and time into learning the Chinese language. And he picked it up very quickly, and Gui Zhen was an excellent teacher. His days were spent knee-deep in the world of biochemistry and science. Then, after hours, late into the night, he spent every waking minute studying Chinese. And you know how it is with a language. It lures you into the culture in a very natural way. The more he learned, the more his obsession became about learning everything there was about the language and of China's science. Needham had written, quote, studying Chinese was a liberation, like going for a swim on a hot day, for it got you entirely out of the prison of alphabetical words and into the glittering, crystalline world of ideographic characters, unquote. Needham's love of the language focused more on the written form than the spoken. He loved Chinese characters and studied calligraphy throughout his language studies. The relationship between Lu Guizhen and Needham grew deeper. She was a wonderful guide as far as drawing Needham in deeper and deeper into the world of China scholarship. There was quite a chasm between the study of Chinese and the study of biochemistry. 
Gui Zhen had left China just before the Marco Polo Bridge incident. She watched from afar with great anguish, wondering what was the fate of her loved ones. And she taught Needham what was going on, the history, the background that led to this moment. And when she showed Needham that because of the geopolitics of the day, no one could come to China's aid. He was dumbfounded. Was this humanitarian crisis not big enough to give cause for the great powers to aid China? Needham saw his own government looking the other way, and he began to get involved and used his stature to engage in various kinds of social activism in favor of sending aid to China in this desperate hour. In pre-war Britain, Needham's was one of the loudest voices speaking out against Britain's refusal to get involved in China. Like the U.S., who also sat on their hands at first, Britain didn't want to do anything that contravened the official neutrality that existed. China would just have to tough it out. Though he had dove headfirst into his China studies, Needham still managed to publish a book on morphogenesis, the study of the fundamental question of how biological form and structure are generated. It wasn't a New York Times bestseller, but it was a big hit in the U.S. academic community. Needham went on a speaking tour in America, dropping in at many of the most sacred of scholastic institutions. He was sure riding high around now, 1939, 1940. While he was riding this nice wave in his career and with his reputation, in late 1939, a secret meeting took place in North Oxford that would lead to Needham's first visit to China and ultimately to everything that followed in his China career. This was jolted into motion by a visit to Cambridge from Dr. Luo Zhongshu. Dr. Luo, originally from Sichuan, was someone who had participated in the May 4th movement and had gone on to teach philosophy in China and had given a talk at Oxford and Cambridge about China's current plight. Luo Zhongshu got the word out about the extent of the brutality under the Japanese yoke. In particular, he spoke of the systematic destruction of China's whole education system and that as many as half of China's top institutions of higher learning had been destroyed from the invading Japanese some of those assembled to hear Luo Zhongshu speak wondered whether Her Majesty's government, quote, should be persuaded of its moral duty to intervene in some way to help the cause of China's intellectual survival, end quote. What came about ultimately was the Sino-British Scientific Cooperation Office, or the Jianxiao Da Xue Yu Zhongguo Da Xue He Zuo Wei Yuan Hui, and the man they put in charge was Joseph Needham. There were plenty of other China scholars walking around Oxford and Cambridge who were eminently more qualified to take on this mission. After all, Needham wasn't viewed so much as a China expert as he was a scientist. But the reputation of his scholarship, his fluency in so many languages, and mastery of Chinese, and perhaps most of all, the passion he had for China's cause. The commission, after a year and a half of bureaucratic wrangling, was green-lighted as an overseas initiative of the relatively new British Council. This mission was mostly about investigating the state of affairs of the most important academic institutions and doing whatever could be done to ameliorate their situation. If a shipment of textbooks, lab equipment, medical journals, or whatever could make a big difference, it was decided to go to the trouble to do it. Needham had told the press prior to his leaving, quote, I was to do everything in my power to renew and extend the cultural bounds between the British and Chinese peoples, end quote. 1942 was the year he left for China. Before he flew to his destination, Chongqing, he first flew to New York City to visit Gui Zhen, who was at that time at Columbia. It was Lu Gui Zhen who instilled that passion in Needham about science in China and all these achievements that had gone unnoticed in the West. It was Lu Gui Zhen's father, Lu Shiguo, a man of science himself, who told his brilliant daughter when she was growing up everything he knew about China's great technical, scientific, and engineering achievements over the centuries. And when Lu Shiguo told his daughter this, China was a nation down on its luck. Missionaries, traders, and travel writers were spreading stories around the world about how Luo Ho, or backward China was. 
As Needham was about to fly to China, the country was occupied by a foreign aggressor. And not only that, prior to the invasion, China had suffered decades and decades of national humiliation at the hands of more powerful countries. So it was only natural that China was scoffed at and better known as the sick man of Asia rather than as the leading innovator in human history. And Lu Guizhen spoke about this to Needham, and he got it. He understood what her father was saying. And in this mission, with the Sino-British Scientific Cooperation Office, he was going to go out and try and do some good. Whilst at Columbia with Guizhen, the seed was planted for science and civilization in China. Simon Winchester said, quote, In New York, he discussed the idea with Guizhen and wondered out loud if he might one day turn this thought into a book that would explain to the Western world just how profound and enormous was China's scientific contribution. The two of them were perfectly convinced that China had invented scores upon scores of other things of which the West was conveniently ignorant. End quote. So Joseph Needham left for China in November of 1942. This was when El Alamein in Egypt, Guadalcanal in the Pacific, and Stalingrad in Russia were all going down. World War II was far from over, and Japan still had a hammerlock on the areas of China they held sway. This was the China Needham was flying to. He arrived in China exactly on schedule February 24, 1943, via Calcutta, and then over the hump to Kunming for a bit, and then ultimately to his destination in Chongqing. And once in Chongqing, Joseph Needham, with his trained eye and powers of observation, began to do that thing that he was very good at. He watched how the local Chinese did a lot of the things they did, and he noticed differences both subtle and great from how things were done in the West. And he used his scholarship in written Chinese to delve into ancient texts and research into first mentions of various inventions and technologies. Simon Winchester said, quote, The Chinese, he kept discovering again and again, had the longest imaginable history of invention, creation, and the generation of new ideas, end quote. Right about now... Needham discarded his Western dress and began walking around in a Chinese traditional blue silk scholar's robe. In this, he had a little in common with Sir Edmund Backhouse. And he was a tall guy, too, 6'4", six, 6'5", six, so you could imagine what a figure he cut back in the day. And so he went from place to place, observing, noting down, and then later with his skeleton crew at the Sino-British Scientific Cooperation Office, he did his researching. From this point forward, until he left China and returned to England, he was on a kind of a scavenger hunt for anything and anything that could be considered a Chinese first. From time to time throughout the years of the China History Podcast, I've mentioned various imperial works, and great encyclopedias from history. The Chinese were not only good at science, they were good at keeping records, too. And even though centuries of disunity, rebellions, natural disasters, invasions, bloody battles, and politics caused the destruction of so much, more remains than was destroyed. And it was these works that were exhaustively studied for evidence of all kinds of scientific discovery and mentions of technologies used and when. His other great passion grew after a short while in China. It didn't take long or too many visits to various colleges and university labs to see that things were in desperate straits. A certain degree of the desperation was due to the Japanese invasion and all the bombing and wanton destruction. But there was also systemic decay caused by neglect during the sad last years of the Qing dynasty and the failed years of nationalist dominance in China. Needham saw the great need for a vast amount of supplies, equipment, and texts. This Needham began to arrange at once. He began noting everything needed, who needed it, and he arranged for everything to be shipped in on government transport. And they gave him priority service, too. Because Needham's appointment, it was hinted, came from Winston Churchill himself. He was treated as a VIP client by the top brass out there. He took a trip to Chengdu. 
this was his first time to test his wings, get out into the countryside, and make some first-time observations about any and all technologies. Bridges, buildings, structures of any kind, machines, tools, methods of agriculture, and anything else that caught his sharp eye. And he noted everything down in notebooks and always, always making purchases along the way of books, curios, or anything he felt would be useful. I suppose, from a long-term point of view, the highlight of this Chengdu trip would be meeting Huang Xingzhong. Huang was born in Malacca in 1920. He was just a young guy when someone described Huang Xingzhong to need him this way. Quote, a brilliant young man, currently boxing well below his weight at a boys' school in Chengdu. It might profit Needham to make use of him in some capacity, perhaps as the very secretary he needed. End quote. They met for the first time, and what is there to say, except this was the beginning of a beautiful friendship. Huang Xingzhong is known to us as Dr. H.T. Huang. And if you look at just about everything Needham ever wrote or published about China, You'll see H.T. Huang's name. Behind every great researcher is a great research assistant. They were quite a team, and not just in the library, surrounded by books. Over the next few years, Needham would carry out a number of expeditions all over China, scavenging for evidence of Chinese firsts. And each time, H.T. Huang was with him, sharing every single adventure, and in fact having quite a few adventures of his own without Needham. With this first Chengdu trip out of the way, and after being hooked up with H.T., Needham decided to head back to Chongqing. But rather than taking the easy way back, he located the less beaten path and took that route back to China's wartime capital. Let me quote from Simon Winchester. Quote, so they headed south out of Chengdu, not east, as the direct route home would have taken them. They first made their way by road down the Min River Valley to a point where the Min joins the Datu River at Loshan, an otherwise undistinguished mountainside town that was the temporary wartime home of the University of Wuhan, normally 600 miles away. They spent five days there, looking over the Department of Physics, which had been housed in an old pagoda, investigating the Colleges of Art and Law, which were in a Confucian temple, visiting a forestry research station, which was in yet another temple, and looking over at its temporary housing in a go-down several miles away from Loshan, the only microbiology laboratory then existing in free China. In Loshan, Needham met a plant physiologist named Shi, who fashioned apparatuses of bewildering complexity out of scrap metal. End quote. At another stop, it went like this, quote, in the small town of Li Zhuang, for example, they discovered a particular treasure. Nestled in the old town, a tiny area almost 2,000 years old, with classical temples and pagodas, courtyard houses and narrow lanes, paved with curious blue stones leading down to the river, there was a small German-Chinese university, whose professors positively fell on Needham as soon as they discovered he knew their language. There was also a Belgian embryologist on the staff, too, and Needham further impressed everyone by talking to him in French about the morphology of the developing human egg. End quote. From Needham's diary, dated June 10th, 1943, he wrote, quote, You wouldn't believe the treasures they have here. The archaeological section has plenty of Han time bronze and jade objects, but the marvel is the famous oracle bones of Shang time from the tombs of Anyang, which have the most ancient writing on them. The people here are running out of tissue paper on which to make their rubbings, so I shall try to get some from India for them. Then the historical section has lots of bamboo tablets on which the classics were written in Confucius's time, and also marvelous imperial archives from the early Qing dynasty, including letters to the Jesuits and decrees to Tibet and a document from the Chinese court appointing the Japanese shogun as king of that country. The linguistic section has gramophone records of the dialects of every province, my numerous inquiries about the history of science problems caused a general stir, and various members of the Institute were running around digging out interesting stuff they'd come across. 
For example, passages about firecrackers in the 2nd century AD, accounts of great explosions and decrees forbidding the sale of gunpowder to the Tartars in AD 1076, that is, two centuries before Berthold Schwartz's alleged original discovery in the West. End quote. The other aspect of Needham's mission that he carried out remarkably was that of flying the British flag and carrying out a most effective form of cultural diplomacy. He connected instantly with his Chinese colleagues and hosts because of his linguistic ability and his obvious love of Chinese culture. That aside, he truly made every effort, using all the formidable resources at his disposal, to help out and get assistance where it was needed. Simon Winchester put it this way, quote, The intellectual communities of the world's oldest civilization, lately almost comatose, would now soon begin to flicker back to life. End quote. From his earliest time after settling in Chongqing, Joseph Needham knew of Zhou Enlai and met him several times. You never hear stories about people who were turned off by Zhou Enlai. Certainly Needham wasn't. They were lifelong friends. The great premier knew a China friend when he saw one. And you could say with a pretty fair degree of certainty that although Britain was allies with the Chiang Kai-shek government, Needham's sympathies lied with the communists. In 1942, Japan was hanging tough and still looking invincible. But as it got deeper and deeper into 1943... Everyone pretty much knew Japan's goose was cooked, and it wouldn't be long before they went down for the count. The invasion of China in July 1937 seemed like a good idea at the time, but now some were wishing they hadn't done that. The way Needham saw it, with the end of the war in sight, his mission was no doubt going to come to an abrupt end. Therefore, he felt a kind of urgency to cover as much ground in as short a time as may be remaining. Needham planned a number of expeditions, four long ones and seven short ones, and covered around 30,000 miles in China, 48,000 kilometers. In line with his ultimate mission, he flew the British flag and conducted himself in such a way as to show the best of Britain. He helped to boost morale and bring anything of value that he could to his Chinese scientific colleagues. And there was plenty of books and Things Needham found along the way or was given that he packed up and sent back to Cambridge. Needham was to Cambridge what Backhouse was to Oxford, at least in terms of the quantity and quality of the works uh, he sent back. In August of 1943, Needham planned a very ambitious, complex, and dangerous expedition. Of all the journeys he took in China, this was his most challenging. The destination was the edge of the Gobi Desert in Dunhuang, at the Mokau Grottoes, the Mokau Ku, this UNESCO World Heritage Site, is also known as the Cave of a Thousand Buddhas, it's a home of 492 Buddhist temples. Specifically, Needham was intent on visiting the particular cave that had been sealed for a thousand years since the northern Song Dynasty and had only been discovered fully intact by some itinerant Taoist monk named Wang Yuan Lu in 1900. Among the treasures found was the famous Diamond Sutra, printed in 868 CE, 572 years before Gutenberg's printing press. Simon Winchester wrote, quote, The fragile document that had been plucked from the sands of Cave 17 showed that China was quite incontrovertibly a nation at the forefront of human civilization, end quote. Dunhuang had been a major trading center as well as a center of Buddhist and religious learning during the glory days of the Silk Road in Tang Dynasty China. However, the city itself was established centuries before the Tang. Needham's route was simple enough. Chongqing to Wolong were, all the wild pandas are today, to Hanzhong to Baoqi in Shanxi, then through the Gansu Corridor, hugging the former Silk Road along the Great Wall, all the way to its end in Jiayuquan. From there, Dunhuang was due west. On August 7, 1943, they pulled out of Chongqing in a Chevy truck with the words Sino-British Science Cooperation Office painted on the side doors. In all, it was a two-truck convoy. Needham, H.T. Huang, the driver, and a bunch of adventurers who were 
hitching a ride somewhere. One of them was an attractive chemist named Liao Hongying, who will find romance later on this adventure with an interesting man named Derek Bryan in part two of the series. They will appear again. It was only planned to be a one-month trip. They were off by three months. Needham first went to Du Jiangyan. Now, I was going to do an entire podcast on this subject, but just in case I don't, let me mention it here quickly. Uh, 250 BCE is still the Warring States period. Qin Shi Huang will not unify China for another three decades, but the Qin is still a kingdom to be reckoned with and was on its way to bringing down the six other remaining states. An official named Li Bing was sent down to govern the former Shu kingdom centered around Chengdu. Ever since the earliest times when people began settling along the major rivers of Sichuan province, the Min in particular, the largest of all the tributaries of the Yangtze, they occasionally fell victim to the same problems as those living along the banks of the Yellow River. Sometimes there was too much water, and the whole plain turned into a lake. You know, when the Himalayan snows of eastern Tibet melted in the spring and summer, that, that produced a lot of water. We could use some of that here in L.A. right now. The building of the Dujiangyan irrigation system around 256 B.C. is the most famous of the three major irrigation projects initiated by the Qin dynasty. Dujiangyan took four years to build, but it accomplished what it set out to do, and the Min River was tamed through the construction of an artificial levee. And this levee, almost 2,300 years later, is still in use. It changed Sichuan province forever, and it certainly changed the development of Chengdu. And it certainly allowed Sichuan province to become one of the great breadbaskets of China. Li Bing is a national hero there. Quoting Simon Winchester, quote, To control the river, he decided to cut a new spillway and channel any excess water through it with a specially designed adjustable diversion dam. It took him seven years to break through the mountain. He managed this by having workers burn piles of hay on the surface of the rocks to make them hot, and then pour cold water to cool them down rapidly, letting the nearly instant contraction crack them open. This cutting led to an opening 70 feet wide, and the mean river waters, which were shifted toward it by Li Bing's clever fish-shaped dam, began to course through it the moment the final wall was broken open." End quote. What is there to say, except this is the kind of stuff Joseph Needham gravitated to, and he became a natural bridge of information for readers in the West who had no idea about science and technological achievement in China. No one else was doing this, and over the course of this first expedition and all the ones that followed, Needham was able to uncover example after example of irrefutable evidence regarding China's technological and engineering superiority. Outside of Baoji in the town of Shuangshir Pu, Needham met up with one of the great characters from PRC history, New Zealand's own Mr. Rui Alley, who Needham came to call, quote, no better friend and no more reliable colleague, end quote. Rui Alley is another long overdue topic we haven't gotten to yet here at the Royal China History Podcast. He was another one of the great ones as far as Western people who came to China and made a life there. Ayali came to China in 1927 and lived there for 60 years and became a CCP member. Among a long list of accomplishments in China, Rui Ali is credited with giving us the word gung-ho, which was later more popularized by the decorated U.S. Marine and great American Brigadier General Evans Carlson. It was very rough going, but after a concatenation of Truck repairs and delays, the group finally pulled into Lanzhou. There, everyone who hitched a ride got out and went their own separate ways. The trio of Needham, H.T. Huang, and Rui Ali continued on west through the Hexi Corridor, which acted as a line of demarcation where the Tibetan Plateau ended and the Gobi Desert began. The route had been traversed for more than 2,000 years, going back to the earliest days of the Han Dynasty and the Silk Road. By the end of September 1943, as Italy surrendered in Europe and German citizens began to be evacuated from Berlin, 
Needham arrived in Dunhuang, 37 years after Oral Stein. But getting there was one endless chain of mishaps from the moment they pulled out of town. Mostly these were related to transport, the bane of many a traveler. I haven't made much about this, but these discoveries by Stein had a huge impact on Needham. To stand before the Mokau Caves and view the paintings made 1,400 years ago, in the time of the Northern Zhou period. It was a very powerful moment. The Northern Zhou was one of the dynasties of the Nanbei Chao that we discussed in CHP episode 23. If you recall, Yang Jian came out of the Northern Zhou and founded the Sui in 589, becoming Emperor Wen. There wasn't anything that inspired Needham more than the caves of Dunhuang, and Cave 17 most of all. It was his obsession some say the very impetus for Needham to write Science and Civilization in China came from this visit. Oral Stein, as the story goes, had famously paid a man named Wang Yuan Lu the equivalent of 220 pounds sterling for 24 wagon loads of papers and precious objects. Simon Winchester wrote, quote, most important of all were scrolls that had been carried by wandering monks hundreds of years before, written in languages as different as Sanskrit, Manichaean, Turkish, Runic Turkic, Uyghur, Tibetan, Sogdian, Central Asian Brahmi, and Classical Chinese. There were also star charts, the oldest in the world, fashioned in the Tang Dynasty between the 7th and 10th centuries, and showing the sky in the Northern Hemisphere with the Big Dipper and Polaris, as easily recognizable as they are in this morning's newspaper. And there, too, was the Primus Interparis, a 15-foot grayish-yellow scroll, which had a colophon suggesting incredibly that it be given away free to anyone who wanted a copy, and which is today known as the Diamond Sutra. End quote. Simon Winchester pointed out that prior to Oral Stein stumbling into Cave 17 like Howard Carter would do 15 years later with... Tutankhamun's tune, quote, It was assumed, one might say arrogantly assumed, that a Westerner had printed the first book, but here was firm evidence to the contrary. Here was proof that a dated document, the Chinese translation of a Sanskrit Buddhist text, had been printed from blocks of wood 600 years earlier. Here was immutable proof that a technique long assumed to have been a monopoly of European inventors, in fact, owed much to far more ancient creators in China. Here was a clear indication that China was no backward nation, but for much of its great age, a highly sophisticated civilization, the certain fount of at least this one human invention, and quite possibly the fount of just about everything else important that was known to the outside world, end quote. I'm not sure if during that September 1943 visit to Dunhuang, if Needham conceived all 17 volumes of science and civilization that he would oversee in his lifetime. But it very well may have been the case, as far as taking in the wonders of ancient China. It was quite an inspiring place. By the way, 80% of the treasure discovered at Dunhuang was carted out of China and is now held in various museums around the world. The rest is in China. But you'll be happy to know there is worldwide cooperation between all the various holders of objects taken away from Dunhuang in the first half of the 20th century. If Needham thought the ride to Dunhuang was calamitous, it wasn't any better returning back to Chongqing. H.T. Huang and Needham ended up splitting up and took separate routes, each getting to star in their own little dramatic adventure. But make it back to Chongqing, they did, and Needham filled up plenty of journals with notes and observations. He was already planning the second expedition, this one known as the Southeastern Journey. This one took him to Fuzhou. Plenty of innovation has always flowed out of that place. Needham will go see a lot of it up close, but that's for next episode, when we look at Joseph Needham Part 2. You know, I mentioned back in that CHP 86 Cultural Revolution Part 4 episode about a man I once knew from the uh, L.A. Guangzhou Sister City Association that I belong to. His name was uh, Dr. Jordan Phillips. Aside from his respected career as a physician, where he pioneered all kinds of innovations, he set up this nonprofit called Medical Books for China. 
It was founded in 1981 after a visit to China by Dr. Phillips and his wife, Mary. Like Needham, Jordan Phillips saw a massive vacuum of medical books and teaching materials following the Cultural Revolution. He set up this organization in the years that followed and into the present day. Medical Books for China International has brought tons and tons of materials to China that have been spread out throughout the medical libraries of universities and hospitals throughout the country. He was a man who loved China, too. Next episode, be looking for more Joseph Needham and then onwards to other topics from five millennia of Chinese history. Until then, this is Laszlo Montgomery signing off from the City of Angels, the entertainment capital of the world, helped in part by this very podcast, no doubt. I hope you'll consider joining me next time for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.